videotaping you yet, kiddo. You gotta wait. Oh, never mind. Say cheese. Ahead of yourself, there, buddy. Gotta fix it first. You need to turn it on. He already knows how to turn it on. Yeah, of course he does. All right, do you want to make it clear that you're not a supporter of the Giants? It's a long story. Go, Cubs, go! Well, this lousy forklift, every time I fix it, something else breaks. It's almost like it sat outside for 17 years. Anyway, I literally just repacked that tilt cylinder. Didn't even make one complete trip with it. And she started peeing out propane, this hose from the tank to the, down to the lock off is bad, blew out on the side. Anyway, got us a new one from the local Clark dealership. Uh, I told them it didn't have to be this long, but I guess there weren't a whole lot of options. Anyway, it's supposed to be correctly rated for propane. Made in the USA, it's an actual Clark part. Should get us fixed right up. That sounds better. Yeah, I don't like all this extra crap hanging out here, but whatever. I guess they come in standard sizes and they didn't want to make one for me, so it is what it is. Howdy folks, welcome back. This is a free four-wheeler, ATV, quad, whatever you want to call it. It's a Polaris. It's a 250. It's a two by four. It's a two cycle. And I believe it hasn't run in 22 years. So it's got an Iowa registration sticker here from 1998. I believe that was probably the last year that it ran. It's been sitting in a barn for 22 years. Well, as you can imagine, it has the typical problems. It's like the mice have eaten the air box. I'm sure that's all full of mouse nests. Uh, the mice have been into the seat. I had to dump a big mouse nest out of there. That's what all this crumbled foam is all about. Uh, the engine does turn over. Oh. But, of course, it doesn't run, and it hasn't run for a very long time. So we're going to see what we can do with it. I don't know a whole lot about two-cycle ATV engines, but I figure we can give it a try. I believe it's, you know, automatic, it's got a, or it's got a torque converter, so you got a low range, a high range, and reverse. So I'm not sure what model this is or what year this would have been made, probably from the early 90s or late 80s, I would guess. Looks like everything's pretty much here. I've got the little snorkel piece that goes above the air cleaner. The fuel tank doesn't look too bad. All the controls are here. The handlebars aren't bent. I'm sure the brakes don't work, but it's got the essential items that it needs to be a running, driving four-wheeler. So let's get to it. Well, first things first, somebody must have stored this battery on concrete because it's seen better days. So we'll get that out of there hook up our sketchy jumper cables and see if we have any kind of spark. Well, I don't think it's going to take a charge. We may not even be able to use that as a core. It's pretty rough. So obviously it just froze repeatedly and 
everything bulged out and busted the case apart. I thought the last ATV battery we dealt with was the worst one I'd ever seen, but this one's pretty rough. I think something wicked this way comes. Well, that went about as well as you might have expected. Had to cut one off, managed to get the other three to unthread. Yeah, there's your critters. Living in the air box. Okay, we got our battery set up. We're gonna remember our lessons from the last time we did this. The rain's, rain is pouring down outside. Here we go. Oh yeah. We got a headlight, we got, what, neutral light. That looks good. So, let's see, turn those off. So we got high beam only. Well, just for giggles, let's see what happens here. Nothing. I know what that one does. Buddy. How you doing? I think you're one of my robins. Well, this should be fun. I think we had a literal rat's nest on top of this proverbial rat's nest. So no wonder nothing works. So we got no starter, we got no spark. And I tried jumping the solenoid for the starter. It does nothing either, so that's probably bad. So yeah, we're not looking too good. However, this Polaris has some kind of a safety switch on the throttle. And I think it's not working correctly or not adjusted correctly. Because watch what happens when I push the throttle just a little bit. We do have spark. Well, we had spark. Yeah, we've got it. So I'm going to try to figure out how to adjust that stop and then we're going to see if we can make this thing run. All right, I found a wiring diagram for this Polaris 250. I'm pretty sure this is right. Mine has this goofy trapezoid shaped power distribution panel. Anyway, studying this diagram, I kind of learned that the way I thought that the throttle safety switch worked was completely wrong, which makes sense because it wouldn't work the way that I described. I thought it was just a kill switch so when the throttle returns that it kills the ignition. Well that wouldn't work because every time you let off the throttle it would die. So what it actually does is it uses a limiter module right over here and it monitors three inputs. The throttle safety switch, the reverse switch, and the RPM signal that it derives from the alternator. So basically, if the engine's running over a certain RPM and it sees the throttle safety switch or the reverse switch, it's going to kill the ignition until it drops down below some RPM threshold. I don't know what that is. But that means that what we're seeing on the machine doesn't make any sense. Why would me pushing the throttle off of that safety switch cause us to suddenly have spark? Because this the RPMs are low enough that this, this unit shouldn't be coming into play. So something's wrong there. Also, this is a CDI ignition, so capacitor discharge ignition. And it works kind of backwards of how we traditionally think about ignition. It's more like a magneto. So in an, a normal ignition system, it's an inductive discharge. So we basically, we switch on the coil, then we switch off the coil and the collapse in the magnetic field basically generates a corresponding magnetic impulse in the secondary side of the ignition coil and we get spark at the spark plug. Anyway, on a CDI system it actually basically is self-exciting 
So it has a coil here that's going to charge up a capacitor inside this CDI module and then we're going to actually discharge the capacitor through the coil, the ignition coil, and that's going to give us our spark. Now they only show one coil here on the flywheel. This is a, a exciter coil, but I'm assuming it also has a second coil here, which would be our trigger coil. So this one charges the capacitor and then this one triggers the little transistor inside here to discharge that capacitor. Anyway, the, I guess the point of that is this ignition system can run independently of anything else here. It does not need the battery to actually work. So in order to shut the thing off, what they actually do is they short it to ground. So this black wire right here comes up to this little terminal and that's where it's going to get a short to ground from any of three sources. So the actual key ignition switch, the little red switch on the handlebar, the little slider switch, or this limiter module. Any of those three things can cut out the CDI ignition. Now, I've tested this with a test light and I can tell you that there's a ground here all the time. So I don't actually know why this CDI module is getting spark or working when I push that throttle. So I guess that's where we need to go from here is figure out what's going on with this ignition system and figure out I guess why it worked. I don't know I kind of accidentally stumbled upon that that magic recipe to make that work. Um, I'm assuming we're going to find a problem in this reverse limiter which I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep if we can't get that to work. So yeah I don't know let's go back to the machine I guess and figure out figure out what's going on. I need to play water. You want to play water? Yeah. Okay. Your son wants to play water? Yeah, I know. We can <clears throat> hit you so you can help me carry it. Okay, I'll come. Let's go. You need help with that. Yep, I'll help with that. All right, so we're going to test this section right here. So the test light's hooked up to positive, the positive side of the battery right now. Ignition switch is off, so if I turn this on and then switch the kill switch on, you can see there's a tiny change in the the intensity of the light, but we still very obviously have a ground there, which doesn't really make sense to me. So I think what we're going to try doing is we'll disconnect this one here from this module. Let's see if we have a change. Hi, kiddo. Yep, I see you. this stupid microphone. Oh, no change. Oh, there is a change. Alright, so I think that might be our problem. You guys see that? Yeah. So like I said, I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep if we can't revive that thing. I think we'll just leave that disconnected. It's alright, everybody's used to it. You can make as much noise as you want. Okay, ignition switch on, kill switch on. Should have spark. And we do. So kill switch off. No spark. Kill switch on, ignition switch off. No spark. Both on. Spark. So that's the way it's supposed to work. I think the ignition system is good to go. If we can get some fuel in this guy, it might run. Now there's a chance that the, the crankshaft seals are bad since it's been sitting for so long. I guess we'll just have to try it and see, see how it goes. It's not too bad, but it's pretty badly varnished, so I think what I'll do, I'll just throw some fresh gas in it and let it sit for a while. Gas is actually a pretty good solvent, especially if it has ethanol in it, so we'll try that first. 
Well, I don't know. That carburetor doesn't look too awful bad to me. I'm kind of wondering what would happen if we put a little gas in there and just, you know, pulled the cord a few times. I'm using mixed gas. I don't, it has oil injection. I don't know if the oil injection works. I'm not 100% sure how we can even test that. Okay. Well, maybe we just kind of hold the throttle open and kind of give her a little squirt. Turn the key on, turn the ignition switch on, and then kind of see what happens. I think it's trying to run. <laughs> oh, come on, baby. Be like that. It wants to go. It just reeks like mice. It must be all over in the exhaust. Oh yeah. All right, it's gonna go. Let's get the carburetor off and Go all musty one on that. Yummy. Hope the inside's better than the outside. Thing is rough. Well, I don't know what's on the outside of this car, but it sure was gross. Yummy. So obviously the float valve was stuck, so none of that fuel was actually making it into the carburetor. It was just running on what we were shooting through the throttle body. So, yeah. At least it doesn't have a bunch of water in it, so we can fix that. But funky setup. So it's got two separate floats that push on this bridge for the the float valve. Yeah, that's interesting. That's got a, rub a rubber tip on the float valve too, so that that's a good thing. Yeah. Just needs a good cleaning. Shouldn't be too bad. It's not too bad. Not too bad at all. So what's that? Half, one, one and a quarter. Yummy. So this one's just our stop for the throttle. Should be able to leave that one alone. 
Yeah, I don't recognize this carburetor. It says MIC. It's not like the Makunis that I've worked on. Yeah. Look at the high speed jet. Completely plugged. That one's pretty clear. Yeah, like I said, completely plugged. So it looks like the emulsion tube is actually pinned in place. We can't take that out. But that's okay, we can clean it pretty good without that. Okay, looking quite a bit better. So the bowl cleaned up pretty nicely. Got the floats to slide on their little pins. That looks good. And the upper half of the carburetor really isn't too bad. So we're ready to put her back together. There's the damage. Pretty yummy stuff. Well, we'll set that aside. And we'll start putting some pieces back together. These little plastic caps keep the floats from falling off. I guess just during assembly, because they can't really fall off. Once the carburetor is put together, so we'll put our seat back together. There's quite a bit of wear on the seat. It's actually worn, I guess, where the corners of the needle have kind of worn that, so it kind of just wiggles around in there pretty badly. So if we have problems with the carburetor and we need to order a kit, this is something we're going to want to replace. But I bet it'll run fine like that. Okay. I'm going to put it back on. Looks a whole lot better than when we started. Hopefully it works a whole lot better than when we started. I know the lighting's gonna suck here, but I've been over this whole machine now, and this is the only mouse damaged wire that I've found. It's this green wire right here. And actually the conductors are still good. So I think all we have to do, hopefully, is just slip a piece of shrink tube over it. That'll work. Oh, the critters. The critters. Well, my cheese eating friends have filled up all the cooling fins on the head, so. Well, the tank's installed, the carb's installed. I filled up the tank with some mixed gas. I don't see any reason why this thing won't run. Let's, uh, let's give it a shot.
right, but it's running. Okay, Ron's does not drive. We got serious problems in the torque converter, I think, but we're making progress. It's gonna be clear full, I can already tell. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, clear full. All right, I think I gotta take this loose first though. That might be the worst rodent invasion I've personally ever dealt with. That's pretty bad. I wish I could get this freaking cover. have been inside. <laughs> oh boy, I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot left. I can already see the this pulley's all corroded. Yeah. Okay, let me get the back.
pretty bad folks pretty bad I don't know if that's gonna make it see how badly pitted that is well there's no sense going any further with these parts I mean they're junk so might as well just get them off there This weight's actually broken too, this one here. So that's never gonna work again. Probably not the right way to take it off, but it's already junk anyway. Yeah, I don't think that's gonna work. Well, I think that's probably as far as we can go for right now. In my opinion, these parts are not salvageable. This flyweight is broken, but you know, the corrosion is just too, too much. And used parts for these Polaris ATVs are plentiful and they're not that expensive. I can buy a good used primary and secondary clutch and a belt for probably 150, maybe $180. So I think I'll go ahead and do that. The engine runs good, so I don't, I don't feel nervous about putting some money into it. I'll probably go ahead and order the crankshaft seals too. Well, at least, at least replace the one on this side. We may not tear the other side apart right now, but you know, the, the stub of the crank's looking kind of rusty and you know the mice have been in here. So I think it would be a good idea to replace that. Other than that, I think we're gonna be okay. I don't know if the alternator or voltage regulator work, but the starter doesn't work. So there's really no reason to even have a charging system or any kind of electrical system, the engine will run just fine like it is. How about you? I'm Hank. Welcome to Hamiltonville Farm. How about you? I'm Hank. Welcome to Hamiltonville Farm. How about you? I'm Hank. Welcome to Hamiltonville Farm. Today, we're going to try to crank up that bulldozer. Today, we're going to try to get this old road grader. You know, it's been forgotten about. It's been sitting here in the woods. Will it start? Let's find out. How about you? I'd like you guys to meet Hank from the channel Hamiltonville Farm. He and I are doing a little collaboration to see if we can give our YouTube channels a bit of a boost. I know you guys like these will it start, will it run type videos. And I think Hank's got some stuff that might be right up your alley. He's had pretty good success getting some very badly neglected machines up and running and driving. I've seen him working on backhoes, graders, semi trucks, flatbed trucks. You name it, he's got it. I'll put a link in the description where you can check out his channel. Be sure to tell him I sent you. All right, folks, let's get back to this four-wheeler. Hold on a minute. Wasn't our four-wheeler blue? There we go, let's get back to this four. Hold on a minute. Still doesn't look right. That's more like it. Anyway, it's been about a week. Let's get back to this four-wheeler project. I suppose that was going to happen eventually anyway. Might as well get it over with right out the gate. So I bought us a used primary and secondary clutch assembly. And these are original 
Polaris parts. You can actually buy aftermarket parts for not a whole lot more than what these used parts were sold for, but I just don't trust them. So you see the secondary clutch has got a little bit of corrosion here, but nothing like what we had. So I think it's perfectly serviceable. How about half inch, fella? There you go. Like so. That'll work. And I bought us a brand new Deco drive belt. Made in USA. This is not the super high performance one, it's the Regular performance one for regular people like me. Yeah, buddy. Now I ordered crankshaft seals. That's this seal right here from the same place I ordered this belt. But somehow something got lost in the translation and I ended up with the belt but not the seals. Anyway, they're going to send them but... It must be by Pony Express or something. I don't know how long it's going to take. So, For the time being, we're just going to put it back together like it is. It seems to run fine. Just the corrosion on that crankshaft scares me. I think there's a good chance that we have, or that we will eventually have seals leaking, but that's okay. Anyway, put a little fluid film on there just so we can get it back apart when we have to take it off again. Sorry, it's not fluid film, it's the rip-off fluid film made by Stabil. Good stuff. Works great, a little bit cheaper than fluid film. I like it anyway. That's it. gonna go don't worry now this tire's got some problems
range. I wonder what high range is like. <laughs> Yeehaw! She's a runner and a driver. Max does not approve. You don't know what to do with that thing, do you, Puppo? She's a little smoky. Certainly a little rough around the edges, but hey, it runs and drives. Can't beat that. All right, folks. I think that's going to be a wrap. Oh, that's just. There must be some more adjustment I have to do with this belt because it doesn't want to stop turning. So I may have to shim a few things or something. I'll have to look into that. Or maybe it's just because it has a new belt. I don't know. Anyway, I got to pull that stuff back off anyway to do the crankshaft seals. And I am going to do that. You hear it kind of doesn't want to idle down very quickly. Usually that's a sign that the crank seals are leaking. So we're going to do it just as a preventative measure. It looks really easy. They come in from the outside. I don't think you have to split the case. Like when I was a kid, we had a Honda Odyssey. It's like a dune buggy with a single cylinder, two cycle engine. And I had to put crankshaft seals in that. And I'm pretty sure I had to tear the whole engine apart to put them in from the inside. So this is a lot better deal. Anyway, this is a 93 I figured out from reading the serial number. And I guess they used the same drivetrain, basically the same four wheeler from 1986 up until 2006. And they made them with four wheel drive. This one is obviously two wheel drive. Uh, the brakes are completely hooped. This is the inside of the master cylinder. It's just rusty goo. So that'll probably never work again. And in order to revive the brakes, I would say we're going to need a master cylinder and calipers. And then I don't know what we're going to do down here for the rear brakes. It's weird. Polaris built these things like a little car. It's got McPherson strut suspension on the front. And then the brakes are all hydraulic. But this is like mechanical with the pedal and then hydraulic with the lever. Anyway, I don't know if that's any good. So we may need three calipers and a master cylinder. Chain's pretty rusty. I've been putting oil on it. We'll see if that frees up. Uh, this one tire I think is pooched. The rest of them aren't that great. But the plastic's pretty good. It really doesn't look that bad. All right, folks, I think that's it. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I actually got this four-wheeler for free. And like I said, it sat in a barn for 22 years. And the mice really did a number on it. And I know Musty, he would have done a laying on the hands of those clutches and gotten that stuff all freed up and used it over again. You know, probably fixed that belt and spent zero dollars. I ended up spending just about two hundred dollars. That's for the new belt, the clutches, the seals, everything. And I'm okay with that. I think that's a good investment. This thing's, it, it runs fine. I don't think it has a whole lot of hours on it. The plastic's in pretty decent shape. It just needs the, the usual stuff from sitting for so long. And I don't know if the oil injection works. So for right now, what I'm going to do is run mixed gas in the tank. And then we'll watch the oil level in the oil tank and see if it goes down. If it does go down, then I'll probably just use the oil injection. It's usually pretty reliable. So it'll be a lot more convenient. Anyway, thanks guys for watching. And I'll see you next time.